How are you? Good, good. He told me to hang back here. Vivek. I'm Donna. I'm Donna. actually Stephen's vice chair. Oh, you are? Yes. What's your name? I'm Irene. Irene, Minion. nice to meet you. Nice no, I don't know about that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, Thank I'm introducing you to you, the Dorchester County Republican Party chairman, Stephen Wright. Feel free. I don't even know what. what you don't know. Nations, well, good afternoon. Nations. Yeah, I don't know what they brought. Okay. Trisha, Trisha, Trisha will know. What, what are you doing today? Books again. Yeah. Nurture and Nation of Victory. But I don't know which ones we have here. That's right. Here yeah. That was a little um, interview like our current oh, president. How are my fellow Republicans doing today? I tell you, it's so great to see so many of you out here. You? Today we are kicking off the start of a town hall series called the Dorchester GOP Presidential Sweet Tea Stop. This is so beautiful. So what is that? Well, first and foremost, for those that are in town, we are the birthplace of sweet tea. Secondly, we plan to host every presidential candidate, so each of you will have an opportunity to ask them the questions that are on your mind. And it is so great to see so many of you here today. And the reason you're here today is because you realize, like I do, that our country is in crisis. But I'm here to tell you some good news. Well, Help we are grateful that you could come on. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be here. I'm so glad to be here. Good, 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 good. We are so blessed to have 2024 yep. start presidential now. candidate Vivek with us today. And one thing that I'm so impressed, I was just with him. And he said, you know, so many people are so focused on the who. Who are we going to nominate? Who's the best person? But none of that matters if we don't figure out the why and the what. What do Republicans stand for and why do we stand for it? We don't have to vote today or this year for our nominee. But if we don't choose the right person to be our nominee next year, the election is irrelevant. So we ask that you do your due diligence. You ask the tough questions. And I firmly believe if we nominate the right person who is right on the why and the what, we will not only unify Republicans and win this election, we will unify the country and get our country back on track. So, so that stage is so not that, the most sturdy in the world. Just be careful. Role <laughs> it's not going to fall. Just government. don't be doing that, no dancing in Canada. Ronald Reagan, <laughs> every single Republican that has won South Carolina that went on to win the nomination has went on to win the presidency. So we pick presidents. Love that. For the first 100 people that got a card, we ask at the end that you go to the back table and you will be able to get a free signed copy of Abate's book. He will uh, be able to answer your questions after he speaks. But I ask that you now welcome the state representative for District 94, Representative Gil Gatch. Thank you, Stephen Wright. Everybody, give it up for Stephen Wright. Doesn't he do such an amazing job here? <laughs> Dorchester County has always been a special place for the work that Stephen Wright has done. Has really made Dorchester the place that we've been in South Carolina. Uh, he's so good. Party. So thank he's you for Stephen, he's amazing. Energy. Guys, we're really excited about our next speaker. As you know, um, he uh, he's been around the block, and I first learned about uh, Vivek Ramaswamy uh, several years ago. I got this book that if you have a chance to go uh, pick up, it's called Woke Inc. And it goes to show that Vivek has been on the front lines of the woke culture crisis for years. He's been speaking against it, and he's been fighting against it. Um, one thing about Vivek, he's, he's uh, some of you might not know this, but he's basically from South Carolina, uh, Ohio. So, almost the same thing. Um, but we are so glad that this is his first stop in South Carolina. His first stop it is just announcing. So Vivek, please come up here, everybody. Please welcome Dorchester County. Welcome for Vivek Ramaswamy, candidate for president of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your warm welcome. Yeah, I appreciate welcome. that. That was great welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the warm welcome, guys. Thank you. I love the excitement here. That's great. That's great. Well, it's my first stop. It's a true story. And thank you for making the rain stop. That was especially polite of you all. I appreciate that. Better than Ohio, too, where I, where I did come from. So 
Look, I, I think that, you know, I, I like to keep a, keep a light mood, but I think that it is a, it is a pretty somber day in our country with the news that we heard this morning. And though I'm running in a presidential election competing against President Trump, I just wanted to, it's on my mind, I just wanted to get it off my chest at the very beginning to say that it would be a national disaster to see a chief political opponent of a ruling party in this country arrested in the midst of a presidential election. I don't care if you are black or white or Democrat or Republican. We live in a self-governing democracy. We live in a self-governing constitutional republic where the people get to decide who run this country. There's something going on in our country right now, right? There's something in the water. It's a little weird, actually. You, you have one secular cult in this country that's arisen in the last few years that says your identity is based on your race, full stop. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. No matter your economic background or your upbringing, by the way, your race governs who you are and what you can achieve in your life. They say that if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged, okay? That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of the squad, she summed this up pretty well when she said, we don't even want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. Now, I tell you something, I don't fit her description of what counts as a brown voice. But there's a really clever move embedded in there, right? The move is this. When your race goes from being about your skin color to being about the content of the ideas you're allowed to have, then any disagreement with those ideas automatically makes you a racist. And there's no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice between pledging allegiance to this new cult and being tarred with that scarlet R, that's when everyday Americans start to bend the knee. And that is what's created this new culture of fear in our country. Fear of losing your jobs, fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school, fear of becoming an outcast in your own community. And that culture of fear is what's destroyed our culture of free speech in America. You ask me, you want to know how well our country is doing at a given time? Here's the way you know it. It's not the number of ballots that are cast every November. That's just the final act at the end of the process. If you want to know how well America is doing, figure this out. What is the gap between what people are willing to say in public and what people are willing to say in private? When that gap is small, we're doing great. But today that gap is as large as I can remember in my adult lifetime. And that is this new culture of fear in our country that starts with this w racial wokeism religion. But it's not just there. That's just the first of them. There's a second cult, a cult of gender ideology in America that came up right around the same time. The cult of gender ideology has some bizarre claims. It's commandments. It has two commandments to this religion. The first commandment is that the sex of the person you're attracted to had to be hardwired on the day you were born. If it weren't, then it couldn't have counted as a civil right. But at the exact same time that you're supposed to believe that the sex of the person you're attracted to is hardwired on the day you're born, you also have to believe that your own biological sex is completely fluid over the course of your lifetime. These two things don't make sense together. It only makes sense if you're not operating according to logic, but you're operating according to a quasi-religious cult. And you know what? There's a, there's a further move this second cult makes, too. It's just like the first. They said that, you know what? The Advocate, a magazine in this country, it's the leading LGBTQIA plus magazine in this country, said that after Peter Thiel, who's a Republican mega donor, he spoke at the Republican National Committee. He's a man who's attracted to men. They said that Peter Thiel is not gay. Why? Because he does not represent the gay voice. See, it's the same thing that Ayanna Presley says. So you're going to start to see a little pattern here that I'll put it together for you. There's a third cult, though, that arose at the same time. 
Okay, the third cult is the climate cult in this country. This is the one that looks like it has some staying power unless we do something about it, which says that on one hand, fossil fuels and releasing carbon into the atmosphere is going to end our existence as human beings on the planet. Yet on the other hand, it's perfectly fine if we get American oil companies to drop projects that PetroChina picks up on the other side of the world without saying a peep about it over there. Okay? One of the businesses I built was actually competing with BlackRock. It's this large asset manager that pushes these environmental agendas onto American companies. And we had some success competing with BlackRock. I started Strive, this business, to compete against them. Here's the dirty little secret. Is BlackRock will force Chevron and Exxon to drop oil production projects. When those same projects, they literally are acquired by PetroChina on the other side of the world. And BlackRock is actually one of the largest shareholders of PetroChina. That's a farce. It's a, it's a sort of cult. And the other thing about this cult, I'll say a word about this before actually telling you what's really going on here, is that the same cult that tells you that carbon emissions are going to result in the termination of the human race, it is also hostile to nuclear energy, which is the best known form of carbon-free energy production in the history of mankind. Vanguard, that's another BlackRock competitor, their ESG funds exclude nuclear energy companies by rule. So what the heck is going on in America? We see the rise of these different secular cults at the same time. What is really going on? The answer is that we're in the middle of a national identity crisis. Okay, the things that used to fill our need for purpose and meaning and identity, faith, patriotism, hard work, family, these things have disappeared in American life. Okay? That creates a vacuum, a black hole in its wake. And when you have a vacuum, that runs that deep, that is when poison begins to fill the void. That is what the woke left preys on. That is what aroused wokeism and transgenderism and climatism and COVIDism to fill that vacuum. Because I'll tell you this, I'm 37 years old. I'm a millennial. I was born in 1985. I'm the youngest person to run for president of the United States or to be elected if I'm successful. Okay? I will tell you this as a member of my generation. We're hungry for a cause. We want to be part of something bigger than ourselves, yet we cannot even answer the question of what it means to be an American today. You try asking someone my age, actually you just try asking somebody any age today, what does it mean to be an American? You get a blank stare in response. That is the moral vacuum at the heart of the American soul. We suffer from this epidemic of depression and anxiety and a mental health epidemic. Why is it? It's because we as human beings, we need to believe in something bigger than ourselves. Blaise Pascal, he's a famous mathematician and scientist. He said it well. If you have a hole the size of God in your heart and God doesn't fill it, something else will instead. That's just a native human need. It's what separates us from beasts. It's what makes human beings humans instead of animals is that we can believe in something bigger than ourselves. We can belong to something higher than ourselves. That is what we long for. And I think this is an opportunity for the GOP and the conservative movement in this country to fill that vacuum, to fill that void with the vision of American national identity, an answer to the question of what it means to be American that dilutes the woke agenda to irrelevance, right? We've been playing whack-a-mole. I've been, I, you got my book there. You know, I've been playing whack-a-mole for a long time, exposing the problem. And there's a time and place for that. You got to see the problem with clear eyes. You can't just show up and say, kumbaya, let's all get along. No, that's not going to work. You got to see the problem with clear eyes, unsparingly, without hesitation, without apology. But then we got to move forward to going upstream and solve the real root cause of the cancer. The root cause of the cancer is that we hunger for what it means to be American. So what does it mean to be American? To me, it means you believe in ideas like merit, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions.
That is why I'm the first presidential candidate in U.S. history to pledge to you that I will end affirmative action in America once and for all. We are done with it. It is a cancer on our national soul. What does it mean to be American? It means you believe in free speech, open debate in this country, that we settle our disagreements not through the use of force, not through the use of police power to arrest our political opponents, but instead through free speech and open debate as citizens in the public square where everybody's voice and vote counts equally. And you know what? The threat to that today is not just from the classical places where even we point to. It's not, I don't even call it big tech censorship anymore. Stop calling it that. Call it what it really is. It is government tech censorship, where the government today is using their cronies in Silicon Valley, who they bail out on a given day, to do through the back door what government could not get done through the front door under the Constitution. If it's state action in disguise, the Constitution still applies. That is what it means to be American. Okay? It means you believe in the rule of law. Okay, that the people who get into this country ought to be people like my parents. I'm not going to apologize for that. My parents are immigrants. They came to this country 40 years ago. They came through the front door. They followed the rules. They paid their taxes. They raised two kids, my brother too, both of whom went on to found companies that helped thousands of Americans. All right, they, they taught us that you're going to run into some hardship. But hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. They taught us that there are sacrifices you make in life. Sacrifice to enter a marriage, you give something up. Sacrifice to have children and raise a family. There are things you give up, but you can make a sacrifice if you know what you are sacrificing for. That's what my parents taught us. And you know what? We should want more immigrants like them. But I will tell you this as a kid of immigrants, that that means we also believe in the rule of law and say no to the people whose first act of entering this country is a law-breaking one. That too is what it means to be an American. And you're not a racist for saying that. You're not xenophobic for saying that. You are an American for speaking truth because we are a nation founded on the rule of law. That too is what it means to be American. It means that you believe these ideals form the backbone of the greatest nation known to earth, a nation that was invented on the idea in 1776, a radical idea that the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who actually run the government, not this permanent state and this managerial administrative class that actually runs the show today. So I became the first presidential candidate to say that when I'm president of the United States, I will do what a chief executive who runs the executive branch is empowered to do. I will shut down administrative agencies starting, as I said to a few in there, the US Department of Education. It should have never existed. We're done with it. $80 billion a year flowing through a federal bureaucracy that foists the woke and gender agenda on our children. Now we're not going to take that anymore. We're not done with it. And you know what I want to take, say this, take this one step further. Okay, there are some agencies that we need to just shut down and leave shut down. The Department of Education is one of them. But there are others. You know what? There, there's, there's certain functions that need to exist somewhere in there. I said we're a nation and we're built on the rule of law. We do need federal law enforcement in this country. But when an agency becomes so cancerous, so rotten, that you can't reform it from above. You do the one thing that is left, you shut it down, starting with the FBI in this country. Full stop. Do not apologize for it. It is still the J. Edgar Hoover building that those people walk into, you lock the doors, you throw the keys in the Potomac, and you build something new to take its place because that's not the only way that this job is actually gonna get done. The next time an Anthony Fauci or a Merrick Garland or a James Comey does their job, yeah, there's some valid purpose to exposing it and complaining about it, but you need to go the distance and do what you're elected to do. You actually fire them. You fire the managerial industrial complex around them. You fire the legions of people under them. That is how you reform the administrative state because it can't be reformed 
You have to gut it. You got to shut it down. It's the model of the Phoenix that's going to have to take place if we're going to rebuild these things from the ground up. So, so these are the basic ideas of what it means to be American. I think if we revive that vision, okay, those common ideals, then we can take on the actual challenges that we face in this country, both domestically and abroad. Okay, domestically, we have a big challenge when it comes to economic growth in America. We used to grow at over 4% per year in GDP till the early 1970s. That's when the Federal Reserve went off the gold standard. And the Federal Reserve is a big culprit in this country. I could talk about that for hours. Believe me, you don't want me to. <laughs> but you know, don't get to do the Q&A. Don't even get me started on that. That's a dangerous subject because I'll be going for a long time. But that, that, that's a big part of the problem in this country. But you know what? If we were, you know, you have a Republican Party and a Democrats now today that just think in terms of small ball, okay? Should you have higher taxes to deal with the deficit? Or should you have spending cuts of Medicare and Social Security? That's thinking small picture. If we restore economic growth itself in this country, GDP growth back to that four plus percent level, if we'd stayed on that track since 1970, we'd have 20 trillion dollars extra that we'd be playing with today. That's actually what we need to do without apologizing for it. But we can't do it if we don't actually believe in our country. Because you have to have a sense of self-confidence to actually produce something. And a big part of the reason why we're not is that we're dependent on our enemy for our modern way of life. This is true today. It's, it is, this is frightening stuff, all right? I'll tell you, I give Ronald Reagan all the credit in the world for taking down the Soviet Union the way he did. But we never depended on the USSR for the shoes on our feet or the phones in our pocket or the medicines that we take to keep us healthy. We never did. That's what makes this different, right? We're in a codependent relationship with China. Codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first? And the sooner we end it, the better for us. The longer we wait, the better for them. And that is why I'm calling for our declaration of independence from China. That is what Thomas Jefferson would have signed. That is what I will sign as our next US president. Thank you. It means we need to abandon this climate cult that shackles the United States while leaving China untouched. Okay? It means we need to win the modern opium war. That is what they have waged on us. The opium war, the fentanyl crossing the southern border saying that, you know what? If we're going to use the U.S. military to defend somebody else's border, you're darn right we're going to use the U.S. military to defend our own. It's not just building the wall. It's use the military to actually secure it. You want to solve that fentanyl problem? Okay, you know, my, my home state is Ohio. How many people have died in Ohio from the fentanyl crisis? It's 100,000 people across the country per year in America today. That's 50 times the number that died on 9-11 alone every year due to fentanyl provided by China, supplied by Mexican drug cartels. And we're just here, sitting here, watching it as bystanders. I refuse to stand by idle and watch fellow Americans by the hundreds of thousands die on our streets, go homeless, contribute to a vagrancy crisis in our cities. I'll say that, you know what a morally justified use of the US military is? You go in there and you take out the cartels using drone strikes, air strikes, even the use of special operations if you need to. That is how you deal with this problem. If we can do it to Soleimani, if we can do it to bin Laden, if we can do it to ISIS in Syria, we can do it south of our own border for the failed narco state that is Mexico. And we're going to get it done. And we will not apologize for it. We got the fentanyl crossing our southern border. We got digital fentanyl in the context of TikTok. You know what? If you're not old enough to smoke an addictive cigarette by the age of 18, I'm sorry, you're not old enough to use an addictive Chinese social media product by the age of 13 or 14 either. We're done with that. And then financial fentanyl in the form of our national debt. We're addicted to China. It's not going to be easy to wean ourselves off. I'm going to be very honest with you about this. 
I know it sounds good to say we're going to declare independence from China. It comes at some cost. Okay, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I'm going to say something that no other, I'm going to bet no other Republican candidate is going to come out and say this because I know I get the calls from the donor class and I'm able, you know what, I, I'm in a position where I'm not dependent on the donor class. Okay, I'm going to say what I believe, whether or not it costs me the donors. I did last weekend in Silicon Valley, lost a bunch of them. I'm losing a bunch of them right now off of this. Okay, I think that most U.S. businesses in this country should not be allowed to do business in China until the CCP either falls or reforms itself. That is what it's going to take. That ain't going to be easy. That's going to involve. It's going to involve something that I mentioned earlier. It's going to involve sacrifice. It's what my parents taught me. Okay, you can make a sacrifice if you know what you are sacrificing for. That is this thing we call America. Okay, and here's how it works in our geopolitics. Here's the trick: the more willing you are to make a sacrifice the less likely it is that you ever have to actually make one. Because China's in an even weaker position than we are now if we would just man up a little bit, step up, and capture that opportunity while it presents itself. We need a little bit less Chamberlain, a little more Churchill. We can make that sacrifice if we think on the timescales of history rather than on the timescales of election cycles, playing small ball as we tend to do. But here's the thing. We can do it if we rediscover that shared national identity. We have celebrated over the last 20 years our diversity and our differences in this country that we actually forgot all the ways we're really just the same. As Americans bound by a common set of ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. I said it to a few of you before, I'll say to the broader group now, I'm, I'm really happy that we have a couple different shades of melanin here, a couple of different genders, two of them. <laughs> it's, it's good, it's a diversity we got here in the room. That's a nice thing to have, all right? Our diversity can be a beautiful thing, but it's only beautiful against the backdrop of something else that binds us together across that diversity. That is what's written on each of our coins at the bottom. It's written there for a reason. E pluribus unum. From many, one. See, that is the dream that won the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over fractious group identity and grievance politics, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we need to revive in order to save this great nation. Thank you all. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless this country. Thank you. 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 All right, we're going to take a couple of questions. We're going to take a couple of questions. So if you all can have a seat, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I see Miss Jenner in the back, and we ask that you try to make your question one minute or less, so that we can get to as many questions as possible. So start out with Miss Jenner, and then we'll go to Mr. Eric. So happy you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question. So one of the reasons I'm running for president and not for U.S. Senator, which I considered doing in 2022, is that there's a lot of U.S. president can get done without asking for permission. Okay? So I bring a private sector perspective to actually interpreting Article 2 of the Constitution, which says that the chief executive, the U.S. president, actually runs the executive branch of the government. Well, I'll tell you something from my experience, all right? 
you hire somebody, if they work for you and you can't fire them, that means that they don't actually work for you. It means you work for them. And I refuse to be the fool who runs for a White House to sit in that position working for an administrative state that sits under me. And yes, I have my background as a legal scholar, but it's also somebody who's built companies to understand that you need to actually execute what the Constitution empowers you to do. So you want to take something like ending affirmative action. I told you I would do it. Fair question. I didn't tell you how. Here's how I'll do it. I'll do it by executive order. You want to know why? Because not a lot of people know this. Affirmative action started with an executive order in this country. Lyndon Johnson issued an executive order called 11246. That's the number. You can look it up. Which mandates that if you're a company that does business with the government, well, that sounds like just a small group, right? Not so much. It's 20% of the US workforce, more actually. You have to adopt race-based quotas. Now, every single president since then could have ended it with the stroke of a pen in an executive order. They didn't do it because this is one of those subjects. Even if you're a Republican, you're not supposed to touch. Affirmative action, you don't touch that subject. Climate cult, you don't touch that subject. Shutting down the FBI, you don't touch that subject. There's certain subjects you're not supposed to touch. Well, for me, the reason I'm running for president isn't because I have some grand fantasy that I'm supposed to fulfill a box that I check in my life. It's that there are things you can do in that position with your own authority, with the support of the people who put you there that you can do without asking anybody else for permission. And I intend to do those things from affirmative action to the climate cult, to shutting down the Department of Education, to the FBI, to the use of the military to actually solve our fentanyl problem on down without apology and without asking either for permission or for forgiveness after the fact. That's my answer. Wow. Thank you. It's actually uh, Vivek. It rhymes with cake. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, I've seen you on the back for many, many things, and you're an inspiration. Question is, uh, energy independence mm -hmm. is extremely important. All you said, preparing our country. Um, like in an air, airplane, you can have your mask on first before you can help others. The same goes with this country. Got to take care oh, I love that. We, we've got to take care of ourselves first. That's good. And then we can be that shining city on the hill as we said to other countries. So the question goes, what do you, how do you feel about the federal government owning and keep on acquiring more and more land? And should that not be returned to the states so that we don't have to rely on the federal government for oil leases and we can become independent in that regard? Love that question. So I got to teach you a little secret. I'm going to use that phrase in my, uh, and you put your mask on in my next speech, all my great lines come from like usually audience questions that I just kind of co-opt and take them. So thank you for that one. I'm adding that one. So, so here's the deal. So there's two obstacles to energy independence in the United States. One comes from the federal government. One actually comes through the private sector mediated by the federal government itself. So that one's the more complicated one, which I'll you have, raise your hand. Actually, I'm really curious. A, a Washington Post reporter was asking me this morning. I said, I didn't know the answer. How many of you have heard the term ESG before? Does this mean anything? Oh, good. See, that's, that's what I thought. Okay, they, they said, you know, you're talking about these issues. Nobody's going to know what you're talking about. I said, I don't know. We have a pretty educated base here. I, I think that I beg to differ. So the way that works is, and I'm just going to, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. I'm just going to tell you like it is. Most of your money is almost certainly invested in funds managed by the likes of Vanguard or BlackRock or others who are literally using your money, your 401k accounts, your retirement accounts, et cetera, to buy shares in American companies. That's the part you want them to do. But the part you don't want them to do is they're voting your shares and they're mandating those companies to adopt emissions caps, scope three reduction plans, and by the way, racial quota systems in their hiring ranks without you knowing it. Okay, so that's a fiduciary breach. It's, a, it's a really the largest scale financial fraud in the 21st century. And before I'm doing what I'm doing now, I started a company called Strive to address it by offering actual vehicles for investing in the market that delivered a different message. So that's vehicle number one for advancing this agenda. And it's arguably the more dangerous of the two because it's not subject to a democratic backstop of accountability, but it's just done through the private sector itself. And that's a complicated problem. I could tell you how it needs to be solved. Government can't do it all. It has to some be done through the market too. But then there's this other issue where the federal government is standing in the way of leases, refinery leases. It's not just drilling leases. Drilling leases, refinery leases, etc. So my answer to that solution will be to shut down the departments that actually engage in this kinds of gamesmanship in the first place. Management. Exactly. And, and, and so, so you, you actually had a complementary solution to that, which is actually return some of those lands 
to the states as well. That's kind of what naturally would actually have to follow. But I want to make a point that the most important part of what you said is energy independence is a national security issue. Yes. Okay. You will hear the debate about Ukraine and wish we'd be doing more or less or whatever. I was clear with you about what my foreign policy priorities are. China, south of the border, narco state, fentanyl crisis ended. Those got to be priorities and foreign policy is about prioritization. But I'm going to make a different point though. That debate is an artifact of the fact that we did not have energy independence in this country in the first place. Because if Putin knew that the West did not depend on him for his oil and gas, he actually wouldn't have gone for Ukraine. So put yourself in his shoes. You know the other side depends on you a little bit. It constrains the cost-benefit calculus of what you're actually going to do. That's the untold part of the story. And there's a fact that not a lot of people are aware of, but it's really important. Is that yes, we gave 100 plus billion dollars in aid to Ukraine, 40 billion of which was just hard dollars. But here's the part you may not know: is that the number one administration in the world who lobbied the EU against its Russian oil import ban was actually the Biden administration. So with one hand, we're giving 100 billion dollars to Ukraine to fight Russia, but with the other hand. We're begging the EU to still continue financing Putin's war machine because we didn't have enough ability to produce here at home. Is that because God did not bless the United States with natural gas and oil? No, it's the opposite. We're, we're a blessed nation. We have been given the gifts that, you know what, whatever we did to earn them, God gave us those gifts, okay? Yet we are rejecting our own ability to provide our own energy security, creating the very wars that we're going to have to fight on the other side of the planet. So energy security is national security. And I think you need a president who understands that deeply because there's an entire administrative and policy training apparatus that will hedge around the edges. You need someone with conviction who's actually going to see that through. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, he, we're, 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 yeah. And then we had one here, yeah. Well, we know that not having the leases is the problem, but have, if we had the leases, I mean, uh, would we start rebuilding the pipelines to get the oil to where it needs to go? Well, a lot of these are pipeline permitting issues, too. You want to take the Keystone XL pipeline, right? That was something that was proceeding under the Trump administration, canceled under the Biden administration. You would have. You know, how many would it be? It would be like hundreds of thousands of barrels a day from Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico right when we could be using it, right right now. Actually, the Keystone XL pipeline, if it had proceeded according to its original timeline, would have been done last December. Okay? That was precisely when we're suffering this energy crisis that creates the conditions for Russia invading Ukraine, precisely when the EU went ahead with its ban on Russian oil imports, precisely when China lifts its coronavirus restrictions, which increases demand for oil. Right around that time, we actually would have delivered the very solution that America would have provided into that world. And you know what? We would have made more money doing it. And you know what? Not only would that bring down gas prices, it contributes to this thing we've forgotten in our country called GDP growth economic growth in our country. So I think it's all of the above, right? I, I, I'm, I'm going to do something I'm not supposed to do here, but I'm going to give you one of the agencies we're evaluating who actually even needs to continue to exist are the Department of Energy and the EPA as well. Now, is that because I'm against an environment? No, I'm not. I think the environment is, I, I'm actually an environmentalist. I believe in clean air, in clean water in national parks in our country. I say this coming from Ohio, the catastrophe that we saw unfolding in East Palestine is shameful. But today, the way those agencies work is if it doesn't have to do with the climate agenda, then it's not a legitimate use of actual action. So that's actually what a climate cult in some ways is holding true American environmentalism itself hostage. And so, so we're making the list. I've identified the first two that we're going to shut down. Whether the others, whether we shut down or reduce the headcount by 90%, I think that a big part of the problem is, and this is a very practical point, when you get people who show up to do a job, they do the job. But if the function that they're performing shouldn't have existed in the first place, that's actually when you create the cancer. And so I just think, a, you know, for the US Federal Reserve, I said this earlier this week, they're responsible 
for the banking crisis in this country. It's just a direct analogy to the energy thing. Their mandate has been to balance inflation and unemployment. They've done a disastrous job. It's like trying to play God, except you have a fat finger. It, it doesn't work well, but you've got 22,000 employees who show up as though that is their job. So I said, I'm gonna cut that workforce down to less than 2,000, over 90% cut, and then put that agency back in its place and say, you have one job. You stabilize the value of the US dollar, period. That's all you do. If you're the EPA, you go back to focusing on clean air and clean water in this country, period. That's all you do without advancing the agenda of a climate cult. Same thing goes for the Department of Energy. Either you're expediting to make sure there's non-fraudulent applications for drilling and refineries and for pipelines, but that's it. We don't need you pontificating about some climate religion foisted on the United States as a way to hold us back while leaving China and Russia untouched. That's actually what reform looks like, and that's what a U.S. president can do. And you know what? Congress might create some of the problems, but I think they can be, for the, this is a good thing, mostly irrelevant in delivering the solution because a lot of this comes through the executive branch itself. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So this is a great question. It actually hits on a nerve for me that we also as Republicans got to look in the mirror and be willing to practice what we preach. That's George Soros, absolutely, and it's true. It, it's, just, it's, it's true. We've put in prosecutors who have advanced the defunded the police movement, okay, the clear the jails movement, which is even worse than the defund the police. And, you know, this is in the name of helping black communities. You want to know who gets hurt most? Black communities across this country. You know who doesn't want to defund the police? You know who doesn't want to clear the jails? Mostly black communities across this country. So this is actually uh, an indulgence of white guilt, white liberal guilt, that actually foists even more harm, wreckage, and even death on black communities. But we Republicans, I think, need to look ourselves in the mirror, too. And it's, it, this is new to me, because this is as, as long as I've been a candidate, something I've seen, too is the influence of money on politics in our own party. Okay, just this last week, the Silicon Valley bailout, okay? So what, I, and this is a long story, and I could tell you guys if you're interested in it, you may have seen me on television about it, but what happened was we used the government to bail out a bunch of Silicon Valley tech companies that made disastrous financial decisions that if that had been an oil and gas bank in the middle of Oklahoma, where oil and gas companies deposited way too much money than they should have in the bank, took these crazy risks. There is no way the Biden administration would come to the rescue. In fact, they'd be saying, let them fail, because these oil companies are profiteering and we want to get rid of oil anyway. This is one more leap in the process. So it's cronyism all the way down. I, I, tried, to, I tried my best. I wrote on Sunday in the Wall Street Journal. They don't publish something. I send it in. I send it in on Sunday morning, and they're like, we'll publish it tomorrow. I was like, that's not good enough. You need to publish it now. They put it out Sunday afternoon. They said, okay, fine, we agree with you. This time sensitive, because I, I, I did not want to see the government follow through and do this. It's a great talking point if you're a Republican candidate, but I think this is bad for the country. And yet later that night, what do they do? They, they go ahead and bail these, bail these actors out. The part that disappointed me is that some of the most vocal actors in the Republican Party Okay, some of the other people running for president of the United States who were vocal about the easy issues, right? You know, was the bank too woke? Okay, yeah, of course. I mean, we all agree on that. But, but the cronyism of the Silicon Valley billionaire donor class, I know how this works. I'm sympathetic to it because I got calls over the weekend. Many said, we're, we're going to support you, but you're going off the reservation on this one. It's going to be, and they tried every argument they could throw against the wall. It's an influence operation, really. They said, well, Vivek, you're against China. This is going to impede our competitiveness against China. As in, not so fast. If these are the silly companies that are going to make those disastrous financial decisions, let the smarter companies be the ones that lead us in competing against China. I said, okay, that didn't work. Then they said, uh, oh, no, you know, there's going to be a, uh, there's, this, is, this is the entrepreneurial lifeblood of America. You should know better. You came from that. I said, you know what? I didn't concentrate that much money in one bank because I believe that you, you have to diversify so when you're building a company, you don't make those mistakes and have sympathy for it. Then they said, Oh, we're going to have a bank run in America on Monday. 
Monday morning, unless this happens on Sunday night, and they were rooting for a bank run, right? They were the ones, Silicon Valley billionaire class, that were stoking fears of a bank run. You want to know how to get a bank run in America? It's through actually stoking fear in the population. But they don't care because that's the justification for their bailout. But here's the thing. Many of them are donors to both parties. Actually, it's not just Democrats. It's also Republicans. And it makes me sad to see many of the most vocal Republicans, including some who are in this race, who have not said a peep since that bailout on Sunday night. And I know why, because you can look up some of those venture capitalists who are then criticizing me, David Sachs, publicly hosted a fundraiser. You can look up who all he hosted a fundraiser for in the last six months, and it will explain the silence to you. So I think that yes, we have a problem with money and politics on the left, and I'm going to decimate that, right? As, as, as a previous president, I think there's a lot you can do. But the first you can do is you got to be on strong footing to do it yourself. Because if you're just going to be a puppet of moneyed interests on our side, then really George Soros is pulling George, Joe Biden's strings in the same way as the Republican donor class is pulling the GOP's strings. And that's equally a problem too, the super PAC problem. It's, and I'm, not, I'm a, not a professional politician. I'm new to all of this. I'm seeing how this game works. It is a farce. It is made up. It is corrupt. And I think that if we clean up the corruption in our own party and in our own process, then we have the moral standing to actually take the other sides and the other guys down. So that's, that's where I'm at on that. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're up against some time restraints. So this is going to be our last question of the day. OK, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Ramaswamy, thank you for accepting this invitation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's been fun. You stated that you were going to reduce federal agencies, which I believe are the, uh, the crust of all ills of uh, America that we're facing right now, anything from border security, the fentanyl, the immigration issues, which we do have laws in place. We just don't implement them. Crime non-prosecution, the energy crisis, uh, I can go on and on. We all know all the ills of the country that we're facing right now. How do you, you said you were going to reduce EPA, uh, we spoke of FBI, however it's embedded, corruption and those individuals that are working with the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. against us. President Trump tried to uh, reduce those federal agencies, a lot of which has the same mission statements and doing the same thing. It can and should be reduced. Are you for small government? And how do you expect to, if you can provide some insight on how are you going to tackle reducing federal agencies? Yep. That is, the, that is right over the target. You're right over the flame on this one. This is the top of my domestic agenda. Okay. So, I'm going to learn from President Trump's mistakes, actually, and maybe I would have made them if I was doing it firsthand too. He's the first person that came in in 2015 as an outsider to do this. He ran into challenges. We got to build on that now to take this to the next level. So I think that the conventional view is that the president can't do this because you have civil service protections passed by Congress. And then there's these other statutes too. One is called impoundment prevention, which says that if Congress allocates money, that you have to actually spend it as the chief executive, even in that agency, even if you think it's waste, fraud, or abuse. It's passed in 1974 to rein in some of Nixon's behaviors. Here's my view. I think that those are unconstitutional if they stop the president of the United States, who's duly elected, from actually running the executive branch of the government. And I have my own personal bone-deep constitutional conviction in that. To not listen to people who came from that very apparatus to tell me I can't do it. So what's going to happen? It will get litigated. Right? Some of those employees, many of them will be sued. I have good news here now. The current Supreme Court is different than the Supreme Court of 20 years ago, thanks in part to President Trump, by the way. I believe on solid ground that that Supreme Court shares my view of the Constitution here. And so we have an opportunity. If we have a president that actually goes in and gets this done this time around, it's not just the next eight years. It's a generation because it'll be codified in Supreme Court precedent that the people we elect to run the government shall once and for all be the people who actually run the government. 
That is an opportunity. It is what gives is a big part. That in China, those are the two things that give me the sense of urgency to make sure we have someone who understands these things and a spine of steel to see it through to actually get it done in this window we're working in between. All right, and, and I'll close on this on that note. In that, I know a lot of talking about the problem can be. You know, a little depressing and a little dour at times. I think we got to see it with clear eyes, though. You can't deny it. You can't just sweep it under the rug and you know pretend like we're living in a honky dory wonderland. We're not. We're we're at a national precipice, actually. But I still think that if we get this right in this window, we don't have to be some nation that's in an inevitable national decline. You know, my second book, Nation of Victims, I was still in a little bit of a bad mood when I wrote that book. You know, a big part of it was, are we Rome? And then I said, no, 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 maybe we're not Rome. Maybe we're Carthage, actually, because Rome lived for thousands of years. We're still not even there. You ask me now, I think that, I don't think we have to be Rome. I don't have, think we have to be Carthage. I think we might just be a little young. Okay, going through our version of adolescence. You know, figuring out who we really are as a people. And you know, the path to conviction, for me, I've been through this journey in the last several years in my life. I think we're going through it as a country now. The path to conviction runs through doubt. We're in the thick of doubt right now. But I think we will have even stronger conviction on the other side of it if we can get there. And if that's true, then I, then I actually really believe, like not in some cheesy politician-y kind of way, but actually, like truly believe that our best days are really, like actually ahead of us and not even that far ahead of us, maybe just a little bit ahead of us, like past November 2024 ahead of us, <laughs> if we're able to actually deliver a landslide election as I think we can, as Reagan did in 1980 and again in 1984, that's the single most unifying thing we could do for this country. And the question I'll ask each of you to think about, all right, and, and join this movement in whatever way you want to. You decide who you want to vote for next year. That's fine. Don't even commit to voting for me. But join the movement to advance this agenda. My website's vivek2024.com, V-I-V-E-K-2024.com. Go there, sign up, be a volunteer, give a dollar. Don't give too much more than that. Just give a dollar, whatever it is. But I think that we have an opportunity to put ourselves back on that path to a national revival and the choice you will face over the next year. And I think Democrats face this choice too. And I tell my friends in the Democratic Party, the Bill Mars of the world, et cetera, say the same thing to your tribe that I'm saying to mine. You have a choice. Do we want a national divorce or do we want a national revival? Whatever it is, it's not gonna happen automatically. It's going to happen because we chose it. It's not going to be because someone comes from on high to save us. Because when it comes to our politics, I'm going to tell you this. When it comes to politics, nobody is coming from on high to save us. If we're going to be saved, it's going to be because we save ourselves. And so I ask you to join us in this movement where we're going to save ourselves. We're going to choose the national revival over the national divorce. And I thank you all for having me here. Let's restore the heart and soul of this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. 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 We thank you all for coming out. Please take your pictures and send it. And if you have a car, go back and you will get a copy of this book. Thank you all. God bless. Where are we taking the I think we're taking them back here, right here. I want to show you one thing. There's yes. only one document that I esteem higher. Let's take a picture, than absolutely. The Constitution, and that's the Bible. Oh, I like. I, I, I didn't mention. While uh, the uh, earth remains, sea time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. I love that. that that's not, which which book is this? Genesis. Genesis. Okay. Chapter eight. Early, early on, it comes early for a reason. Yeah. Thank you. And so I, I appreciate that. It does. It does actually. It defeats I, all of it. I'm Lionel. You just got up and said all the things that have been burning in my heart for about four years.
Thank you for saying that, my and, and, But something that needs to be addressed, there is a actual migration going on in our nation. Of course People are abandoning the Rust Belt and coming south. They are. It, there is a migration going on that needs to be addressed. And we need to, and so I live in that Rust Belt. Yeah. So I know it, I feel you. Yeah. Uh, we're, 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 right. welcome, we're welcome, every, we love everybody. Yeah, but, but, that, but the nation somebody, has, somebody has to talk about it. That's, well, some, we're gut that's the valuable assets up there that doesn't need to be well, we've got the country. Absolutely. Yeah, anyway, thank Absolutely. you. Thank, thank you, thank you so for much. saying thank that. You. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Thank, thank you. you very thank much. You. Thank you for coming. I appreciate thank that. You. I appreciate that. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Hello. My husband's going to take one too. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it. Okay, okay. Hi, sir. How are you? Thank yeah, you. please, please, please. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for all you're thank doing, you. sir. I appreciate it. It's that. an absolute honor. Thank to you so much. It's an honor to be here. Thank you so much thank for you coming. Thank you.